I, I no, I Boom. have to say, yeah. but if you look at the art of community and pick something that I really liked about it, I would say that I really liked the proofread. <laughs> <laughs> Because I did, <laughs> as opposed to D- as opposed to DHTML Utopia, which was not proofread. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, oh, this is devolving music, quickly. Right? Was- was June 9th, or as it is better known, 6 forward slash 9 in the United States, and the other way around, which is wrong, in other parts of the world. In the United States, that means that it was Bill and Ted Day this very last week, and as luck would have it, this is also episode 69, 69, dudes, dudes, <laughs> this is a most triumphant episode why is it Bill and voltage. Ted Day? What's that? What? It's sixty nine, uh, dudes. What's that got to do with Bill and Ted? Do you not remember Bill and Ted's excellent adventure? They're standing in the front of Circle K, which <laughs> there are things afoot, and they <laughs> slam down. There's two versions of Bill and Ted: Bill and Ted from the present and Bill and Ted from the future. And one side of Bill and Ted wants to pr- prove: Is this really us? And they say, "Well, let's prove it." What number am I thinking of? Sixty nine, dudes. They nailed oh. it. They nailed it every time in that constant infinite loop paradox that is the front of the Circle K in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. So this is the Bill and Ted episode of Bad Voltage. And if, Stuart Langridge, you name this episode anything other than a reference to Bill and Ted, I'm going to be so friggin' <laughs> pissed at you right now. Jeremy, what are we talking about in this episode? So that was a very long-winded way of Brian saying that, unfortunately, we weren't able to get together again, and this show is, once again, just pre-recorded bits of us. <laughs> <laughs> totally joking. This time, we do have all four of us. Uh, wel- welcome back say, to the, the Real Bad Bolt. We no listeners. Back in. <laughs> and, and one thing we're going to talk about in this episode is uh, money and open source and how do communities use and raise money fairly and effectively. Uh, all right. We're also going to hear another six minute scream from uh, from brian lunduk where he's going to be reviewing the dell xps laptop with ubuntu and he's going to let us know his thoughts and we've recently seen a whole bunch of people leave the own cloud project and set up the next cloud project we ask what the hell's that all about and now back again bad voltage If there's one thing I love about the open source world, it's drama. I love it when when things seem to go to shit and then other good stuff happens and then some other stuff goes to shit too. It's very exciting to watch, especially when you're not in the middle of it. So goes the story of OwnCloud. If some of you have been paying attention to the news, you'll have seen that over the last month or so, the one of the founders of the OwnCloud project, Frank Karlicek, left OwnCloud Incorporated, a company he founded, um, and just kind of generally citing some very vague reasons where he just wasn't satisfied with the way it was going and kind of wanted a change. Now, After that happened, many of their core developers left and their community manager left and people began leaving OwnCloud Incorporated. And then uh, they announced it. They announced what was happening next. And by they, I mean Frank and company. They were producing NextCloud, which is a complete fork of OwnCloud, rebranded and renamed as NextCloud with a couple of key changes. So... I had a chance to sit down and talk with Frank Karlicek and Jas Portlevitz, who is the community manager for NextCloud, to see what the differences were. If you go up to my YouTube channel, you can watch the whole thing, but we'll we'll talk about a couple of key pieces in here. And the key takeaway is this. They did not like the way OwnCloud Incorporated was going. OwnCloud Incorporated had a CLA, a a contributor licensing agreement, that they just simply did not like. They did not like the way it was going with some closed components, and they just generally did not like the way that the community was being incorporated into the corporation itself. So here comes along next cloud. Now, we're recording this on, what day is today, guys? Today's June uh, 13th, right? June 13th. Something yeah. like yep. that. Okay. So, so by the time this comes out, 
the very first version of Nextcloud will have been released, and it will be essentially compatible, essentially essentially its own cloud renamed to Nextcloud with a few changes. Um, but the changes are really significant. Specifically, there is no CLA anymore at all, making it much easier to contribute to the Nextcloud project. There are no closed bits at all anymore, meaning all of the enterprise bits are now completely open source, and, and then they can go and, and focus on the features that well, that they would like to focus on. And so you're going to see the two diverging rather, so, rather rapidly from there. But that's the basics. Let me and ask you some questions, because kind of cause I've, I've not been keeping up with this. I know, Brian, you've, you've been fairly involved with the story and what's going on. Like, so I've got some silly, silly questions. That's probably our listeners who are not familiar with this as well. Will, ask will them, ask. man. I will see so if I know. Is, so the own cloud corporation organization, right? Wasn't that set up by Frank? Yeah, it was set up by Frank and some other individuals who were still running it. The, the company still exists, though interestingly. So once NextCloud was announced, um, one of their uh, funders basically canceled, I believe how it works is they canceled OwnCloud Incorporated's line of credit, causing OwnCloud Incorporated or Corporation to close their U.S. offices entirely, um, which... It, basically is a kind of an extreme thing. So you see the quick, rapid downsizing of OwnCloud Incorporated and the quick, rapid growth of NextCloud, which is but hang on, fascinating. Hang on a sec. So you've got Frank who set up the company not completely. You know, I think, you know, they, they had investors within the company and, and they had multiple people involved within the company. Frank is one of the guys who, who set the company up. He, you know, was kind of the, the, the big Mac daddy founder of the project. So he was always kind of leading the charge on the community side of things. But the corporate side, I think, was a little different story. Um, and I think as time went on. I think, and I think a lot of people who have been in startups can kind of empathize with it. They've he saw the company drifting in a different direction than he wanted. It was a little but less that, community. He wasn't the CEO in charge of everything. He was just kind of the the helm of the community side and the lead of the technical side of the but project. But what, what doesn't add up to me is here, and yeah. I'm sure that it's just because I don't know enough about it. But so <clears throat> apparently, own cloud they closed around like I think it was about six million dollars in funding like a few years ago. Yeah. So they've got VC funding. Frank is, is leaving and obviously taking like the, the heart and the soul of own cloud is going with him and hence becoming next cloud. Right. So it strikes me that what's happening here is they're leaving because they're not happy with the way the company is, is steward in the project and, and treating the project. But what right. I don't understand is if he was either the founder or the co-founder of the company like VCs don't tell projects how to run their communities generally. Well, like, I don't. I don't think the company, and I could be completely wrong about this. And um, if I get this wrong, Frank Yoss, if you're listening, I know you are. Go into our our community bedvoltage.org forum and correct me. Please correct me if I get this wrong. But uh, my my understanding is Frank didn't have, you know, full veto and controlling power of the company. As the company grew, as as VCs, you know, contributed to the company, other people had a lot of voting share in the company to help drive the company in certain ways. And I think he just wasn't happy with that. And I think... Well, I think VCs gathered- invested in a narrative too, and the idea, at least... And I'm about with Jono on this one and that I don't know a ton about it. The kind of subtext that I got is that the VCs invested in what they considered an enterprise file sync and share platform. Right. And, and so the other Frank features wanted it to be more of a priority. wide platform. And it, they they certainly haven't come out and said it, but the idea that I got is he's friends with the guy that founded Spreed Me. They wanted to integrate yes. it. I think the VC said no, and this is the end result of that. That's from what I can tell. And I'm sure there's much more to it than that. Yeah. I think in general, the direction the company was going in a way that he didn't like that the VCs were dictating terms that he felt were onerous. He didn't like the CLA. He didn't like some other things. He didn't like right. the, where the line was being drawn with proprietary apps versus open apps. <clears throat> from what I, I understand from one of the interviews I heard, tried to fix it internally, didn't feel like he was able to, and then pulled the rip. Right. Yeah. I, I just, it's the, uh, the, and I'm not suggesting I'm an expert on VCs by any stretch, but just as far as I'm aware, as far as I was aware, most VCs tend to stay out of the, uh, the, the <laughs> no, policy no. and technical operation. No, no, yeah, no, I don't know. Hang one on, yeah, no, absolutely, hang on. Not absolutely not. Hang on. Yeah, hang, by an Jesus extreme Christ. way, no. <laughs> Let me finish my point. The point I'm making is that generally VCs, will 
place a, st- a set of requirements on what, they're, uh, on what they're expecting the company to accomplish and how they're going to grow. But in terms of things like how the community is being run, I'm assuming that the VCs wouldn't care about that. Oh, no, they care. They care so a ton. I, so, so VCs, as a general, from my experience, having been involved in a couple of startups that have had VC backing, um, you're right. They do. They set a couple of outlines. They're like, we want to meet these requirements. We want to meet these dates. Here's our key messaging. And if you stick to that, we, we provide you funding. The problem is the VCs really have a lot of flexibility, typically, because it, it's an interpretation of that. They will begin threatening to pull funding if uh, uh, additional things aren't met, which may not have been under the original purview. VCs, they what they see needs to happen can change with the wind rather rapidly. Uh, it's a They're a fickle bunch, they are. And VCs and so are different, right? There's some good VCs, VCs and backing. there's some really, really bad VCs, so I don't know what you're going to say about with, but I th- I think you might have got lucky and dealt with some good ones, but... Uh, Sli- at least slightly, the impression you get is that, um, and I may be being very unfair to Frank here, but I think, you know, he built the, uh, he started building the own cloud project, and then people came along and said, let's make a company out of this, and then we can all make money and get paid to do it, and maybe make a yeah. ton of cash. And he thought, yeah, this sounds like a great idea. Get involved. And then, you know, people come in with funding, and they'll say things like, okay, we're giving this funding in order that own cloud becomes successful. And then you only get 18 months into the project, 18 months into the company, before you realize that Frank's definition of successful is it does loads of stuff and it's all open source. And the VC's definition right. of successful is Ford have bought it. <laughs> right. well, uh, well, that's we, why, like, I, I guess that's where I'm, I guess that's where I'm a bit confused is it seems to me as a summary that, uh, that the primary reasons why this split has happened were within the pur- purview of, a, of most founders. And obviously, if this has happened, that's not the case. I'm not suggesting Frank's lying at all to us. No. It, just seem, it just seems like this, these are relatively I, small fry issues I, I, that could I, I, have been I, I solved you're within seeing, OwnCloud. Um, there are two different kinds of founders. Um, you've got the sort of founder who, who builds a project and wants to create a company and then goes away and creates it. And then you've got... Frank, the impression I have, and I may be doing him a terrible disservice here, but he's <laughs> he's a tech guy. I think people came to yeah. him and said, there should be a company about this, because well, then we can make a bunch of money. And he's like, okay, he was essentially CTO. Like, he wasn't the founder right. in the sense of running the company. I think people people in suits showed up and said, let's build a company. He went, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. That means I get paid and we can build all this stuff and we've got some cash to do it. Why not make it happen? And then he realized that as the as the company went on, they were kind of pushing things in, in, order, to, in order to do that money and justify the funding. They were doing a bunch of stuff that he didn't want to do what i think is interesting right. i think is, i think it's the last the last part of it I, the last part of what you said i think is spot on the first part i'm not so sure about right I, I i may be being unfair what's interesting here though i think the impression i have with Nextcloud is that he's thinking right i've learned a lot now i've now learned something about yeah. running a company but i've also learned a lot about the kind of people i don't want to bring on board because my overriding goal is <laughs> the project and the open sourceness and so on and we'll get funding where yeah. we can which i can accept but as far as i can tell all all the techies have bailed to Nextcloud and no business people, which means that they'll probably have a really vibrant, brilliant open source project, but it's not clear to me how everyone gets paid three I, months from now. So, so, so I, so I asked them about this um, and, and I really do recommend, so I talked to them for about, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. And we had some of those questions along the lines, like how are you getting funding and whatnot? Um, and it does sound like they're, they're well-funded for, for, for quite some time, is my understanding, and that they have the, the money available to bring on basically the, the bulk of the people they would need to bring on from own cloud should they decide to leave own cloud. Uh, Frank even put out a, a thing on Twitter when he heard that people were being let go from, from own cloud because it needing to downsize a little bit. He's like, hey, come to next cloud. We, uh, we want you. We're, we're hiring. So, uh, it, you know, think of that what you will, but I think it seems like they're, they're going into this pretty with a pretty even head on their shoulders. It doesn't seem like they're, they're jumping in without funding or anything like that. And it doesn't seem like also they're jumping in with like a, a mountain of, of different VCs who are demanding that they just produce something that's essentially a Dropbox clone, which I think was part of the reason why they, they decided this needed to happen. They didn't want own cloud to be relegated to an enterprise storage product. They wanted to be in the future. They wanted to be own cloud. You know, it has collaboration software with it and video conferencing applications 
and and you bring all these things into own cloud for for self hosting of everything that Google does for you online basically and and I think their their plans were much bigger and being in own cloud incorporated kind of stifled that ability and forced them to focus on what the VCs really wanted them to be focusing on which was enterprise storage as a product solution. And so I'm pretty okay with it. Like looking at it, I get why they had to jump out. If I were the guy that started own cloud and I wasn't being allowed to take it in the direction that I wanted to, for whatever reason, whatever bureaucratic or money reason, I'd want to jump out and find my own way to do it too. So I, I, I kind of get why they did it. Question. Yeah. I, um, I don't know. Is this similar to what happened with my sequel and becoming Maria DB? You know, you, you you build a project and then uh, it, 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 you you grow a company around it. The company gets taken over by the sort of people who are pushing the project in the way you don't want to. So the technical person leaves, taking the code with them because they're, it's open source and they could do that. Sets up another right. company which is intended to run more in that way. But I don't know much about the whole Maria DB I, Monty. I would situation. say there's some similarities seems, and some differences from, there's from some. my yeah. perspective. Yeah. I think. I think what's potentially an interesting thing is not so much at this point, what was the motivation of uh, Frank Karlicek to, to do this? Because it's happened, right? It's done. You know, it's this split has occurred. The real question is, if you're a user, if you're someone who wants to be using own cloud or currently uses own cloud, what do you do now? Where do you go? Where do you put your faith in going forward? Because right now, next cloud is literally a drop in replacement for own cloud. Like it's just a quick transition over to next cloud, the trademarks change, the names change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but other than that, they really haven't diverged much at this point. As time goes on, they're going to diverge incredibly. So as a user, you know, what do you do? Um, and what I think is really interesting to me is if I'm objectively looking at both own cloud incorporates approach versus next cloud's approach, there is no way on God's green earth that I would utilize what own cloud incorporated is producing simply because of things like uh there's closed source bits in own cloud versus not in next cloud it's all open source well, it, well uh, he, he the, made it, it very clear that he was not things. promising that there would be zero proprietary bits he's very clear about that it's not any guarantee that it's going to be 100 percent open source in frank's it, words in Frank's words, up until just recently, so uh, so on the the initial release of Nextcloud has zero closed source at all, including the enterprise components. Um, so and that literally just happened. So as of as of our recording of this, that information is fully embargoed. Uh, by the time this comes out, that will be that will be public. So you could see where their their his thinking on this has been has been evolving. You could see him trying to get to a point where he's trying to make everything completely open source which that's i weird. kind of applaud the thing that the thing i mean so i think there's a few things we should bear in mind one is that we don't know i'm not defending vcs but we like jeremy said vcs are very different in the way they operate and we don't know what the yeah we don't really know what we we know frank's side of the story we don't know what the, the side of the story that uh own cloud have got so that's and true. I'm, again not suggesting for a sec frank is an awesome dude and you know we're all big fans of him and he's got the best of intentions there's no doubt about that but we don't know the reasons behind this the thing that worries me a little bit is it sounds like basically there was some kind of awkward balance at own cloud arguably because of this investment in through some means yeah. and frank's leaving to have more independence in that which i think is an admirable thing and lots of people do that and i think monty did that with my with, with when they right. split off from my sequel the thing that worries me a little bit is how they can make Nextcloud successful if they it, it looks like they're primarily looking to fall back on a consulting and services model based upon what they've got listed on the website. Yeah. And I just don't know how widely that can scale. I think yeah, that I might think be more difficult to to be sustainable long term, maybe than they imagined right now. Well, I think right. I think they're going for the this a similar model to Red Hat and Sousa. You know, I mean, it's 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 services and support is they, really what they're going for. Going uh, forward, I mean, yeah, I can see that. Fine, no problem. But Red Hat and Sousa have buildings full of people who spend all day saying no, it's more expensive than that in mirrors selling. Uh, selling software to the enterprise market is not something where you can just wander up and go, oh, I've got a CD here, just stick it in and we'll work it all out. It's a no, genuine totally right. skill huh? that techies are not generally very good at. Technical yeah, sales is hard. Well. You're, you're totally right. You, you're using, totally right about that. And, and using Red Hat as an example, while 
a lot of their software is free and, and available to get, you can get it for free. The whole focus of Red Hat is they've built a platform and an ecosystem that you buy into. Right. They provide services uh, that you buy into, which is a Red Hat done great work with their business model. But to do that well, you have to scale up significantly. And the way in which you do that, arguably, is through VC funding. And what worries me is that they may have burnt some bridges at that point. Uh, I want them to be successful. I'm just worried about, given what's happened, I'm just a bit worried how how they're going to accomplish this. Because I would all love to see NextCloud be yeah. a successful, thriving business, of course. Right, I just, right. I think, also, I think we're all on board with that. I'm also kind of curious, too. I, I think that maybe some people underestimate, if you look at a recent example that I, is not similar reason-wise, but similar in that it was a fork, and LibreOffice forked from OpenOffice, right? And every technical person I know immediately used LibreOffice. Every one of them. Right. Yeah. OpenOffice yeah. still has way more mindshare in the mainstream Way more non-technical person, open office still has way more mind share just because of its name way recognition. More. So yeah. uh, it's very difficult to undo the massive amount of marketing that has gone into this initially. And I, I'm curious how they're going to. It would be great if yeah. we could talk to them, but I'd be curious how they're going to tackle that issue because just just because Nextcloud might have all the smart technical people now and a much better model as far as people who like open source go, that does not in any way change the mainstream perception of own cloud is own cloud and what i've never heard of next cloud i don't know what that is so it's not always no, about no, quality not it's, it's that's going to be a tough hurdle i think to overcome you're, you're yeah, totally I, not wrong they've got an uphill battle ahead of them in a lot of different ways I, and i just in full disclosure i have no involvement with the company whatsoever i make i know i'm sounding a little bit like a like an apologist for next no, cloud right yeah, now you're, but I, you're a fan I, of what they're doing I, you know? I'm, I'm glad i'm happy to see them do such a thing i like it when companies are moving clearly in the right direction and i like it when people take a firm stand and say you know what no more of this bullshit no more clas uh no more issues with trademarks um you know we're gonna we're gonna do this right and we're gonna have the features we want we're going to be totally open source that I, I i feel like it should be applauded but i i think you're absolutely right there's a ton of uphill battles ahead of them i think they're doing some things right in order to get some of the own cloud people to come over like they're offering if you have an own cloud subscription currently they're offering to honor that if you just switch over to next cloud um, so they'll continue to support you they'll, they'll just bring people on over so if you want to go with them it makes it an easier transition whether or not people will you know take them up on that in, in large enough numbers to make the business successful long term who knows maybe maybe not but i i think they're approaching it from the right enough standpoint the only other thing i would say is rapid changes can occur uh, a good example of that is ubuntu Ubuntu came from literally nowhere and took over and at a time when the word Red Hat was synonymous with desktop Linux and realistically just clobbered that market in two years time frame. Yeah. It's it's not undoable. It, it, it's, it's happened many, many times, both in the open source space and in the broader technology space. So it's not an undoable. Unsurmountable I don't challenge, know that that's a but it is hard. Terrible answer, though. You're, you're talking one. One was a fork, and one is a new product in a market that Red Hat clearly didn't Ubuntu want, and was still not doesn't a new product. Want. It was a it bunch was. of patches new, on top of Debian. It was essentially right, but the perception a, essentially, is that it was a new project. It wasn't a ground up new product, right. Right. but you're talking about a situation yes. where there's a new project with a fundamentally different goal than Debian. Versus a case where this is literally just a fork product, and the first release is ch basically changing well, the name from. Old when Cloud Ubuntu to next came out, the the entire stated purpose was just make Debian nice and usable. I mean, that was that was the stated no, it wasn't. goal. It wasn't. Yeah, that's, no, not, that's absolutely not true. Right. <laughs> what was and, the stated and, goal then? It's Linux. No, no, I hate to digress, but that's what I remember. The stated goal was to build a powerful desktop operating system. It had. It was not making Debian prettier. That was the snark that you got from Debian users. Ah. Um, also, I would also question Linux without, for human beings. W right, and I would also question that that at that time Red Hat was synonymous with the desktop. Nothing was synonymous with the desktop back then. It was everyone's possible game. Um, the desktop just wasn't very. 
exciting back then. There was no commercial deployments of desktops uh, back then, really. I feel uh, like our next episode, we should have a segment around this, because I remember things very differently 10 years that, ago that than would I be think interesting, you do. Actually. It, it, it would be interesting. And I mean, also, I think the stats of users differ, uh, agree with me and not with you. But I, I think we should, we, should, we should look at this, because I've been, I've been comparing, I've been posting these charts in conference sessions for the last about eight years on this, and I, I have a lot of video to go over. So uh, let's do that next, <laughs> next episode. Uh, and and anyway, hopefully by two weeks is... from now, um, Nextcloud would have found themselves a charismatic multimillionaire. <laughs> <laughs> a, a bald, charisma, charismatic astronaut, multimillionaire. Um, anyway, so this is this is interesting. Um, if anyone has thoughts on this, I, I would love to hear from own cloud people because what I'm curious about is: Are people that are using own cloud going to move over Pretty to next cloud? Do they plan to do so? I'm really, I'm really curious, legitimately yeah. curious. So head on over to the forums and talk about it. And also Frank Yoss and anyone else over at next cloud or own cloud. If we got anything wrong, we probably did. Yeah. Please Let correct them. us because we get yep. things wrong a lot. I am a portable man. I like laptops and I like tablets. It's been years since I've owned an actual desktop PC, which means I ask a lot of my mobile gear. I need them to perform with desktop power. Enter the newly updated Dell XPS 13 Developer Edition. The model I got for review comes with a 6th generation Intel i7, 16 gigs of DDR3 RAM, a half a terabyte solid state drive, and Intel's Iris 540 GPU. Portwise, it has two USB 3 slots, an SD card reader, and a Thunderbolt port, and a Thunderbolt port, which I will only likely ever use with an HDMI adapter because Thunderbolt is stupid. Oh, and the screen. It's 13 inches with 3200 by 1800 resolution. It's gorgeous. It's absolutely freaking gorgeous. The keyboard is full size and the keys feel satisfying to type on. I've written roughly 30,000 words on this XPS over the last few days and I have no complaints about it whatsoever. The laptop itself is sturdy. No flexing or bending when you pick it up by an edge. It feels high quality. I like to touch it. And I touch it a lot. When I received this unit, it came preloaded with Ubuntu 14.04. After using it for roughly half an hour and quite satisfied at the performance, I decided to let Ubuntu update to the latest version it was able to update to, 15.10. Upon completion of the update, Ubuntu failed to boot. I don't blame Dell, I blame Ubuntu. After monkeying around with it for about 5 minutes, I realized that I didn't actually want to be running Ubuntu on here anyway, and I quickly grabbed a flash drive with OpenSUSE Tumbleweed on it. Also tested this little beauty out with Elementary, OpenSUSE Leap, and Ubuntu Mate. Every single one ran beautifully. The only hiccup I ever encountered was that Elementary didn't find the Wi-Fi chip. But after some quick searching, it looks like that would be a simple fix. Battery life when running the OpenSUSE and using Xmonad as my window manager, yes, I'm hardcore like that, was a little better than six hours. Not too bad, especially for a laptop with these high-end guts. Performance is fantastic, which you would expect considering the stellar specs the SPS has. This rig handles all of my video editing and gaming without batting a single eye. I love it. I absolutely love it. If I'm being extremely picky, the one thing I wish was changed is the stupid friggin' Thunderbolt port. Get rid of that mostly useless hole and give me one dedicated HDMI port so I don't need to bring an adapter with me when I want to do a presentation or something. But other than that one tiny annoyance, this is damn near the perfect laptop. Good battery, great screen, sturdy, fast as hell, and importantly, shipping with Linux. So let's be clear. Ask me some questions. Ask me lots of questions. I got a question. You ready for this? Oh boy, am I ready. Listening to the spec of that, that is an absolutely tip top, copper bottomed, high grade, (laughs) maxed out laptop, right? Most of them do not have, most of them are not spec'd up to that degree. So, this particular laptop you got, how much would it have cost? Two grand. 
Two thousand dollars. Yeah, nice. Two thousand dollars. Twenty eighty is the retail on the one you got. Yeah, yeah. That's so that was reasonable. actually going to be my That's question. Would you, pay, would you pay? Would you pay twenty eighty for that? So. I'm a cheap bastard. I really am. I mean, I'm, I'm a super cheap bastard. <laughs> so, no. my, so other than this laptop, the laptop I spend most of my time with is a uh, Lenovo ThinkPad that literally cost me $240. <laughs> so if that tells you anything about the hardware I typically use. No, this is, it tells me more about your Patreon and how it's going. <laughs> yeah, ain't, that, ain't that the truth? Seriously, though, patreon.com forward slash Brian Lunduke is a oh, fantastic oh, oh, way oh, to know. make sure Brian gets better <laughs> hardware. Um, so, so no, here's a realistic thing. Um, if I needed like a really good video editing rig on the go, 2000 is absolutely worth it. I would plop down 2000 for this. If I just needed a word processor machine, no, this is, that'd be stupid. It'd be stupid to spend that much money on a word processor web browser box that costs 2000 bucks. That'd be just ridiculous. But it plays games so well for a laptop. I mean, it's, it's such a good gaming rig. It's such a good video editing rig. It's so fast, and the screen is so choice. I just want to lick it and cuddle with it. Uh, it, it is a fantastic laptop. If, I, if I'm in the market for a high-end one, I think right now this is probably the laptop to beat. There are some other laptops that have a similar price and spec range, but they're a lot yeah. bigger. And the bigger laptops are great, but if you're going to a conference, you don't want to lug around a 16.3-inch you know, gigantic beast of, a, of nah. a laptop with you just to do some video editing on the go. This one, it'll fit in most messenger and laptop bags without a problem. It's sturdy. It's got good battery. I, so I, I can't really think of any problems. With Speaking it, really. of the battery, you said you got six hours out of it, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, about six hours. A little bit, a little Terrible. bit more. But. So what's interesting if you go to the Dell site and you compare the Developer Edition, which is the one with Ubuntu, to the regular XPS, which is spec'd out exactly the same. Mm-hmm. The the Windows one, which interestingly has a battery life column, is rated at eighteen hours. The Linux yeah. one, they don't even have a battery life column on the nope. chart. Well, nope, they, they don't. They, There's they no way too- it should be three times different. Well, there were two sides to that. The first one is that Windows are actually better than us at battery life. Um, yeah, but it better. shouldn't be. Yeah, way However, yeah. 18 hours is the most outrageous piece of bullshit I've ever heard in my whole entire life. <laughs> <laughs> was, was Even shockingly given the fact that manufacturers surprised. tell nothing but lies about battery life, there is no way on God's green earth that it had lost 18 so, actual hours. Okay, okay. Here's here's the reality, right? 18 so, Lego hours, maybe. <laughs> when, when I get about six hours of battery life out of this, it's not sitting idle. It's encoding video. It's playing games. It's actually doing real hard crunching stuff and so uh, if, okay. you're well, if you get six hours of gaming and, and video encoding yeah. that's different i don't i don't do time tests where i you know turn the laptop on and walk away from it and just see how it does i turn it on and i set my largest 1080p video project to encode and i see what the hell happens okay. um so Fair. so about six hours so if you think about it in that point of view it's realistically battery wise an all day machine it's right. it's gonna last you all day by the end of the day you'll probably need to find somewhere to plug in for a while but realistically it'll last that's you all fine. day yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, like I mean, once once you get above about four hours four to five hours in my mind it's like well you're probably not gonna have a problem it's gonna last you most of an airplane flight no matter how far you're going you, you know i mean it's it's gonna last so it's it's okay yep um, I have a question. Oh, the- I should I should point out. So I wrote a review about this for Network World about a week ago. Uh, one of the guys over at Dell got a hold of me because I trashed the Thunderbolt port on here as well in that article. And they, he reminded me that it also doubles as a USB Class C uh, port as well. I did not realize that when I wrote uh, both this review and my other review. That does make it a bit more useful uh, because Thunderbolt itself is really stupid. Does it charge um, from the USB C port? I don't. I don't think it does. I think it just oh, acts as, it's as just a output. USB Type C. It's got a separate. Yeah, it's got a separate charging port. So I have a question for you. Uh, I've owned a bunch of Dell machines in my life, and yeah. the one criticism I've had traditionally has been they've all dropped to bits in a relatively short period of time. Um, now, Ack is the exception to this rule who's been carrying around a dell laptop for about 15 years <laughs> even though he has to plug it in all of the time to use it um but wait do I you can, really still have that, that laptop well my m thir- my m 1330 yeah it's not it's now not the my one that you have to keep plugged anymore. in 
Yeah. Oh. Um, I, it's not my primary laptop anymore, but I need a laptop, and I don't need a laptop very much anyway. But yeah, I still <laughs> what have is it, your primary there's nothing laptop? wrong with it, other than the fact that you have to plug it in. And it's it's not 15 years old, you cheeky bugger, but it might be 10. Hey, hey, Langridge, what is your primary laptop now? It's huh? Dell. With the what twi- kind of Dell? <laughs> it's, it's the Dell, uh, I'm not sure what it's called, M10, I think, with the twisty screen. Oh, yeah. Where did you yeah. get it? Where did you get it, Mr. Langridge? I'm curious. Uh, 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 which, which store did you buy that from? <laughs> I got it from a friend of mine who donated it to which me. Which friend? <laughs> in, exchange, <Anyway. laughs> in exchange for this free other thing. <laughs> Stuart, in just ex- get out of the way and say, thank you, Jono. You're amazing, Jono. So he'll shut up and we can move on with the rest of the review. Thank you, Jono. Anyway, You're amazing, yeah. so, Jono. Um, so he'll shut up and get on with it. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> So, yeah, what's the build quality like? Because, I mean, I, I'm, I don't want to suggest that Dell... No, no, no. Am, I know, I'm making the I'm same quality I, that they have 10 years I, I've ago. I've had, had the same difficulty with HP laptops. Like, I've had three HP laptops over the years, and all three of them just basically started cracking and creaking and bending and falling apart within a year or so of owning them. Um, this one, I mean, it's always hard to tell. I've had it for three weeks now, um, so I could really give it some some good going through, and... It it feels extremely sturdy. Like, you know how the, a lot of laptops, you know, when you open them up, there's like a little bit of give and a little yeah, bit of bend yeah, to the yeah. screen. It doesn't have any of that. It's hard as a rock. It, it kind of, it, it's clearly not that uh, brushed, you know, metal feel of like a Google Pixel laptop. So it doesn't have that right. feel to it, but it, it it's close. It's, it's very close cool. to that. It feels very yeah. hard, which I like about it. I like my laptops to be just beefy feeling. I want them to be kind of a little bit heavier than they think they should be. And they just really hard. Like if you club someone over the head with it, it probably would kill them. And I feel like this one is in that category. And it's good that it's got the really good screen. Because looking at um, people working on the uh, and, and purchasing the previous iteration of the XPS developer laptop, a lot of people complained that it had a pretty noddy screen, you know, 3066 yeah. by 768. And the fact that this is like now super... A uh, high DPI screen is really, really good news. However, yeah, crazy, crazy there, high DPI. There is, so um, so high I, it, that I usually downscale it because it's only a 13 inch screen, and at that high of a resolution, most desktop environments don't support high DPI all that well. I mean, even even Ubuntu yeah. Unity doesn't support high DPI all that well. It kind of chokes in some places. You've got to almost just have the resolution in order to make it really usable, which with, is uh, a yeah. nice problem to have. It is. It is a nice problem. I'd like to see that get better. Well, um, the two the two things that annoy me about this laptop conceptually I haven't actually <laughs> used it but the the two kinds of things are first of all <laughs> stop releasing laptops that don't charge off USB C manufacturers stop inventing your own well, stupid wait, wait. proprietary to be, to be clear, power socket I don't I've never tried it because I I don't have any reason to try it pretty sure it I, doesn't though. If, I'm if, pretty if sure it, did, it doesn't. I didn't yeah. see any listing of it, but um, I haven't tried if, it. If, if it did, then no, they wouldn't have did, supplied it, it with a power supply, the... right? They'd have supplied it with yeah, a USB-C true. power supply. And the second thing that annoys me about it is, if you're going to invent a new laptop, invent a new name for it. Because now if someone <laughs> says, I've got the XPS 13, you've got no idea whether they're talking about this incredibly leak, you could beat someone to death with a high DPI screen super laptop, or the one from two yeah. years ago, which has got a crap screen and had some it's, serious it's driver problems. It's true. So I, I wrote up I wrote up an article reviewing this, and I, I struggled with the headline because I'm like, well, I can't just come out and say I'm reviewing the Dell XPS 13 because there's been Dell XPS 13 reviews published every six months for about the last five or six years. Exactly. So you know, it, I think this is the fifth generation or sixth generation of this laptop line, and sometimes they do differentiating it by by calling it like fifth gen or whatever. But it's just the same, they kind of do need to change the name up a little bit but it is it's a great laptop it really does it runs everything um if you get it wipe wipe ubuntu off it immediately because if you upgrade ubuntu will kill itself um and just put on a real linux distro and it should be fine it would be it would be interesting to see what happens now that 1604 is out if you upgrade to 1604 or whether and they should be shipping it with 1604 anyway i would expect um, I would expect is, pretty soon. Yeah. yeah, this is this is one of the reasons why I tend not to run the interim releases. Right, you run fourteen oh four, which is fine. Then you run sixteen oh four, and that's fine, and it's all good. 
Now I should it's also, also I should also point out so, that the the stock version of Ubuntu that it shipped with did have custom repositories for adding in some additional drivers. I have not bothered with any of those repositories in any of my testing with all the other distros. So it doesn't need them if for anything that I can find. Oh, that's like good. there's no like I'm sure there's a, you know, I my guess is it probably just has a custom patch to automatically make Wi-Fi work maybe on older Ubuntu distros, which is why elementary didn't automatically detect it, those sorts of things and maybe like a repository with a package for desktop wallpaper or something. Yeah, but it, I, I think it doesn't seem no. to need it. Del, it's good to see that Del, it's, it's good to see that Dell decided to uh, ship with the Sound Blaster 16, so we can make sure that it's working out. The <laughs> yeah, box. no, I believe it's an ad lib card. It's ad lib. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dell De- De- have a, have a, a reputedly, I don't, I can't confirm this myself, but they have reputedly got a lot better at pushing those sorts of changes upstream rather than just keeping oh. you know the, the Dell PPA with the drivers in it. They're actually getting back into mainline now. One one downside I should note that I fi- I figured out after I do this. I usually when I use my laptops for doing any audio work, I plug in an external audio source. I have like you know like my 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 Blue Yeti or or I have a uh, uh, what's it called? I can't remember. The, but I have those little external uh, audio sources, and I pu- pull everything through there, and I plug my headphones into that. I did plug in my headphones directly into the audio jack of this. There is a very slight hiss very subtle very low um i don't think most people would notice it too much but it is a little bit so i would say that there seems to be a little bit of interference with the audio jack not a lot not enough to piss me off but it's there and it's worth noting recently the idea that projects need money to run has started to be embraced by the open source community. We've seen a whole bunch of different projects try a whole bunch of different ways of earning money, whether that's Patreon or Kickstarter or asking for donations or selling proprietary plugins or whatever. But the question I have here is, if you are a community project and you get some right. money for whatever reason... How do you decide what best to do with it? You know, if you get $50,000 from Kickstarter or you get a regular Patreon income or whatever, how do you fairly and effectively parcel that money out to do relevant things? I think a lot of it depends on how you're asking for the money. So, for example, Kickstarter, you're typically saying, I want this amount of money to build this thing or to make this thing. And people, I think, in that setting are feeling like they're buying something. But then you have something such um, as... Yeah, Kickstarter is perhaps not a good example because that's very much, we need this specific amount of money to achieve this specific goal, and therefore the money goes into the goal. So ignore one-shot Kickstarters. I'm thinking more in terms of donation money or um, Patreon or something like that. I can tell you one example. Like when, When I was at Canonical, we set up the Ubuntu Donations Fund, and the way we set it up was... You know, when you go and download Ubuntu, there's some sliders and you can choose where the money will go. And then at the end of it, it just goes into a bank account. And the community-related bits and pieces, my team had purview over. And basically, someone went and they fill in a form and they ask for some money and they explain, you know, they provide some details of who they are and what yeah. they're going to use the money for. And then we basically just make a determination about whether people are going to spend that money wisely. And, and then Jonathan that- Riddell yells at you about it. It's just something like that, right? Well, let's not forget that Jonathan Riddell yells at everybody about everything. This is true. Uh, so, uh, so what would happen is, yeah, the we'd make a determination on that, and and then we we do that. What was interesting is that I think that worked out pretty well because generally, the thing that most people didn't realize is that there were not that many people asking for money, and in almost all cases, the money was approved. And we kept saying to people, go and ask for money. Just yeah. go and ask for money. There's money in the thing. Well, I think they're, this is one thing that especially you. smaller projects just aren't good at is understanding that there's, there is money out there available that was pretty easy to access in a lot of cases, as Jono kind of said. And they're not good yeah. at asking for it or clearly defining why they need it and for what they need it. So I think if you're a smaller project, one of the things you can do is get a list of things saying we need X amount of money for this specific thing. Right. And I don't think a and lot I, of yeah. community projects think, especially have that. 
You know, I, I, Jeremy's totally right about that. I think a lot of community run projects and like smaller organizations just realize that ongoing, they end up having expenses from time to time and they just kind of hope they can have someone that gives them money to cover it when they arise and they're not necessarily forward planning for it. And it's, it's hard to do. I mean, it's, it's hard to look forward over the next calendar quarter or half year and say, okay, we're going to need X, Y, and Z. And that takes people to actually do project management and planning. And a lot of developers just don't want to do that crap. That's boring ass stuff plus like there's a lot of great funds out there but a lot of the people running these projects don't even really know they exist like there's there's some great funds that could give them stuff but they don't really know to ask for it let alone know how to ask for it i think that's a big problem yeah the that i think the thing is as well is um, uh, john i mentioned the uh the ubuntu community fund which if you're doing an ubuntu or ubuntu flavor specific thing you could apply for stuff for that you say i I want i need a phone to test this kind of thing on or i'd like to go to this particular conference i think it'd be valuable or i'd like sponsorship to get the tickets or whatever but on a more general thing you've got linux fund right jeremy you do which I was going to bring up. Tell actually. us about that. So, yeah. <laughs> Tell us about it, so, Jeremy. <laughs> and this is why I think this is kind of an interesting topic. And I said, community, smaller communities, especially are not very good at this is because I was added to the board of the Linux fund uh, a couple years ago now. And what the Linux fund is basically is a n- nonprofit whose main goal is to help Linux and open source related projects fund things. Uh, but what we really need is a, specific amount of money to, t- to accomplish a specific goal or target or task or, but it, it's pretty wide open. It doesn't have to be anything technical. It can be, we need this hardware because we want to write drivers. It can be, we want to go to this conference and pretty much anything in between. It's, it's almost completely wide open. And I started in earnest a few months ago, reaching out to people. So I put it in our, our newsletter, which goes to, you know, a little over 300,000 people. I posted it on the site. I posted it on Twitter. I posted it to Reddit saying, you know, if you are an open source project that needs money, please contact me. All we need is a targeted amount and a specific goal, a task, whatever, kind of explaining what I just did. And I figured we would get, we got a ton of people saying, yeah, I want money. <laughs> Almost no one got back to me with, I would like $1,000 to attend this conference, or I would like $700 right. to buy this device. And the, it has been extraordinarily, shockingly difficult to give away money. Shot. I got. I know that that okay. was the thing that struck me with the Ubuntu I, 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 thing I wanna, as well. I, I, wanna, I, I hate to diverge from this, but I want to stick to Linux Fund for just a second. I have a questions for you, Jeremy. To start yeah. with, in your time in, in during the, in being on the board for Linux Fund, what is the smallest request you've received? Like, like what's the smallest amount that someone's asked for? I, I'm really genuinely curious. <laughs> I don't <laughs> I think anyone's something. asked for yeah. less than a hundred dollars. That I can recall. Do, I mean, no one says like, we who's... need $7 for something. It just hasn't happened. See, this is what I'm wondering. Yeah. <laughs> What's the biggest request you guys have received? Ever or since I've been on the... Since, uh, since you've been around. Did, yeah. Did five, Microsoft ask you for the money to buy LinkedIn? <laughs> okay. So, so, so like five grand. So, so five grand or so. So realistically, people aren't coming to, you know, Linux fund and looking for uh, enough funds to cover like a, a full-time developer working on things. It's more for Correct. like one-off specific goal accomplishment ah, sort of things. Now, like let's go to a conference with a booth or something like that. This sure. is, this, this is the thing I was, I was going to say there. As Jeremy says, Linux fund is really there for, we want to do this specific thing for which we need this specific targeted amount of money can we have that much yeah. money and they go yeah okay now you have to do the thing with it and the um the ubuntu donations fund uh, the community donation fund is exactly the same thing it's we want to do this specific thing for that we need this much money can we have that much money but there's there's much less of a a facility for kind of ongoing stuff where it, it's not that someone wants to have um five hundred dollars to buy this particular tablet to do the port to it or fly right. to this particular conference in germany it's like what i would like to do is i would like to work on this open source project in the evenings for a month and get paid for that somehow but no one's really set up to do that yeah, I, yeah. Well, I think patreon I'm, I'm that's something slightly... we would definitely consider at linux fund and i think patreon is kind of set up for that and there's a couple other open source sites that are kind of set up for that really uh, well, right. uh, well, well. This this is the the kind of wider goal of the question. Is imagine your project and you've got a Patreon running and it, it pulls in five hundred dollars a month or something. So not much, 
But then some people say, well, I've been working on this project. How about you bung me $50 a month of that to carry on working on the project? How do you decide what? who gets the money and who doesn't? Who's justified and who isn't? Without tearing your project apart into a massive civil war about who gets the dollar. So in cases that aren't like Linux Fund, where it's not for a specific thing, for a specific person with a specific goal in mind, general funds for small projects like that, I could see that causing a, a lot of issues. And I think one interesting word you added is how do you do it fairly in the intro? I, that's a yeah. really difficult question that's going to be really based per project. And I, I think that in many cases you will probably cause some consternation in some projects. Depending I don't on think how you can. I don't think you can reasonably in a non-commercial project. I don't think you can pay some people and other and not pay other people. Yeah. Like even if you have one person who's a maintainer and they're doing really good work and blah 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 blah, it's just it will it will always default to some people feeling bent out of shape. The reason why I li like what the Linux fund does is like Jeremy said, you know, it's a specific thing for a specific purpose. So I need a graphics card to write a driver, you know, is a very tractable, tractable thing. And to me like right. that's, that, that's way easier to do something like that. But giving people money in exchange for them doing work seems it's, re it's really hard, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah but, we do the, but, I mean, it's the same, same, you know, for Linux fund or Ubuntu for the community fund, or I'm, I'm on the open SUSE board and we do the same thing, but it usually ends up being, we give out money for travel expenses to conferences so people can go hang out and work together or, or, or hardware. And that, that usually ends up being what it all goes to. It's a single shot. Here is a receipt, a receipt. receipt. Yeah. But this is what I yeah, think exactly. is interesting. Um, I admit that a lot of the reason why the, the Ubuntu fund, Linux fund don't get, as many applications as you'd expect is because people don't know about it or they feel embarrassed stepping forward and asking for money. But I think that a lot of it is also that there aren't necessarily these specific targeted goals. You know, if I'm going to spend the next six months contributing my time to some project that I'm interested in, it's not like I can say, OK, I'm doing this one specific thing. I work on stuff. Right. As and when it becomes available. And the money isn't out there for that. And it's if, if you do approach Linux Fund and say, I would like, you know, I, 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 I want to hack on a bit of for a few months. And, I, and it would be nice to get a bit of money back so I can afford to do that, even if I only get enough to spend it on coffees or whatever. It's much more <laughs> difficult to quantify how much money you deserve for that work. If you say, I would well, like this I think tablet... It in our specific case, money, it's easy. And I, I can only speak for us, but for us, it comes down to right accountability. We want to make sure that we're good stewards of the money we have and give it away right. in a meaningful way that we want to make sure that the money we give out causes real benefit to the open source community. And we take that very seriously. So yeah. people just that makes ask a lot of for sense. random amounts of money. It would be so hard to take that and say, well, is that a fair use of our money? Because you don't know really what the return, right. for lack of a better word, the return on the money is going and, to and be. I think but I think that's the same thing if you're the leader of a project, right? If you've got some kind of ongoing uh, monthly or whatever regular funding, like Patreon or donations or whatever, how you decide what a, what a, what an activity in the project is worth. Someone says, I wrote this right. module, and someone else says, oh, but I triage 642 bucks. As, as Jeremy says, the word fairly here is really, really, really difficult. And everyone avoids it by just not doing it. But it means and that you can't pay you, for Do we think it would be a net win, though, if we did do it? Would that make, would it result in better or more open source software or no? Would, would putting money in the equation at that level be it net win or net loss, well, do you think, long term? Funding only, only if it's consistent in a large enough scale that people can use it as their living. Otherwise, then people can't. And I don't know that they'd be able to really dedicate any ongoing, consistent extra time beyond what they currently can. I, th I, think, I think the thing that we I think the only way in which you... Oh, go on. I was just going to say, I think the <clears throat> if you're talking about giving money to people to do work. I think the only way in which you can do that fairly and accurately is if people submit a statement of work and that statement of work is shared publicly with the community. And once they've done the feature, they get paid for it, which isn't going to work as well in open source because you want people to maintain that feature as well. Yeah. Outside right. of that, it seems to me that the best use of this money is for, is for covering expenses. Like, I think part of the problem here is that a lot of community members, frankly, don't even think about asking for money. The I, amount of times when I, we were running the fund in, in Ubuntu, people, I'd be at a conference and be like, well, I can ask for that. Well, it's I just not ask, a lot of people's you know, motivation I, either, right? When they get into open source right, at that right. level. It's, like, 
I think, you know, if I was a community member, I would never dream of like asking for a thousand dollars to go to a conference or something like that. But the other thing as well, which I think is missing from this is tying somebody's reputation and their standing in the community to this. So as a tiny example, one of the things that we used to do at Ubuntu when we did UDS is we'd have like 50 slots for community members to come to, to, to UDS and we'd sponsor them out. And the way we did this was that everybody could submit an application to come to UDS. And then each of the engineering managers in Canonical would go in and rate, basically rate that application. And, you know, from this person will add incredible value to UDS to this person will be significantly detrimental to UDS. And the average of how all that panned out was actually a reasonable reflection of, of people who came to UDS and offered value. So I wonder whether you could adapt that kind of model in a community somehow. So like if somebody, uh, for example, says, I want $1,000 to buy a graphics card or something like that to write a driver, other people could go in there and add testimonials to basically uh-huh. say, okay, this person's got decent standing in the community. And then just some kind of lightweight way, because that to me is the thing that's missing is you just don't know whether some random is actually going to use that money fairly. I, 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 I hate to digress. So when you're, when you're thinking about people coming to UDS and you're thinking about who would be detrimental to come to UDS, are there any names that really jump out at you of people who would be truly detrimental to have come to UDS? Oh yeah. There was, there were, there were times when individuals would get completely blackballed from coming to UDS. And really? In, in, in fairness, those people were absolutely right to be blackballed. Uh, very rarely was anybody, very, ra- very rarely would anyone submit an application. In fact, never did anyone submit an application who'd never been to UDS who got here's Here's out. the thing that just dumbfounds me about that. And I don't disagree with anything you said, but having been to so many conferences, including ones with you fine gentlemen, I <laughs> have seen how profoundly drunk and misbehaving people get at these conferences. It yeah. amazes me. What, what exactly does a person have to do to get blackballed? When, well, when most people don't, I, that's the what it, what it what it is. I'll t- I can tell you exactly in terms of co- the of UDS. What it was is people who want to be paid to go, and then they don't show up to sessions. They don't contribute. They you know if, if we're having a like we had an event in in Orlando once, and there were certain people who just buggered off to Disney World during the days, right. And it's like, yeah. you're not doing it on our dime. This is, this is, this is not about doing bad things at night. It's about not doing good things during the day. <laughs> okay. okay. In, in, in all fairness, I, I have seen Jono get terribly drunk, but he always got Never up. Happened. And even with a hangover, he showed up at his sessions. <laughs> so <laughs> while, while I could tell you were miserable and having the worst headaches of your life, uh, you still were there. Uh, so hey, I, I consumer think, professional. No, so, I mean, so I guess back to the... Right? On a, on a, go ahead, go ahead, on a slightly more serious note here, I appreciate the fact that, you know, getting funding to get new hardware to test things out or to fly to conferences or whatever is important and everything, but it's not actually work, right? <laughs> it's right. ancillary shit that lives well, around is, work. And surely sort of what work. we're missing is that we're not motivating people to provide sustained, ongoing contributions to a project. That's if, fair. If it's yeah. kind of, you know, you yeah. fly in, you do this one little thing, you get some money to do it and then you go away again then we're putting together patchwork we're not actually building right a consistent community and is this not some kind you know and now we've we're at the stage where some projects actually have money and we still can't get it done are we not missing something out here <laughs> what no what's, I, I think what's interesting I think go we ahead, have. Brian. I think a lot of the pieces are already in place. I mean, like the work that you know the Linux Fund does and the Ubuntu community, Open Source community, all these all these different organizations provide those one off funding bits for the conferences, the hardware, say some server costs, something along those lines. And we do have s- mechanisms in place for providing people with ongoing revenue, like Patreon that we've mentioned. So, like for example, and I'm not the best example here, but so I have my Patreon page, right? I'm not using it to produce a whole bunch of open source software, but the people who contribute to me know that they're contributing to me for the wide array of random crap that I produce because they want to see more random crap from me. And there's a lot of developers on Patreon as well that are developing uh, for a bunch of different projects. They contribute 
contribute here and there, but people see them as being beneficial. I think I think even Eric Raymond has a Patreon page. So like a lot of people do that in order to either pay the bills, the kind of the bare minimum to make it so that they can continue to sustain a level of involvement in the projects and type of work that they do. And then I think people can then reach out to Linux Fund for going to scale, for going to Ohio Linux Fest if they want to drink cheap beer for three days straight. They they can reach out to those sorts of individual one-offs to cover those extra surges of, of, of revenue that they need. The problem I think we come across is most people, and I think we've already talked about this, either don't know that they can, or they feel kind of embarrassed asking because they're walking around with but their hat in I their hand and telling people and put I money be wrong here, But I think more what Stuart was talking about is how do we get trying to think of a good example maybe someone like the maintainer of our doer how do we get that to be a sustainable job because the quality of software that he puts out is very high how do we right. get him to be able to work on that full time for years i think it's more along the what lines is, of what what, what is Stewart interesting about that is at least when when i was at canonical using the ubuntu fund as an example i would say the majority of people who were submitting to that fund for money were the kind of people who like going to conferences, the kind of people who are inter- interested in advocacy. And that stuff is really important. I can't think of hardly any situations where developers write in code with ask for money. It was That's invariably it was people, people who enjoy that kind of work. And they did really, like, there was some of that one that was used really well when people would exhibit at scale and whatever else. But it is a very distinctive demographic of people who would ask for that money. Maybe it's different in some projects. Maybe in a... I don't know, Node or something like that, you'd have more developers. Well, I'd be oh, curious, too, if it would behoove us kind of as a community to use some of this money for things. Like, good, some developers want to develop code, and they'll develop code for free, and that's great. But there are some things that just aren't fun, right, that are crucial to a healthy project. I wonder if you can use some of the money to do some of those more like tasks, anything like in project Ruby, management. Right. <laughs> You might very well think that I couldn't possibly comment, but <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, it, I it, 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 it feels like there ought to be more here, and maybe that's exactly the idea that if you've got some ongoing money, use it to sweeten the pot for people who are doing uninteresting but essential tasks, whether that's. You know, uh, there's kind of a a feeling in the open source community that everything is interesting to somebody and therefore you wouldn't want to pay someone to do documentation or bug triage or tidying up the wiki or whatever because someone will find that interesting and then they'll come along. But I'm not sure history actually bears this out. Yeah. Jono, if you give the lib paper sizes guy as an example, I'm going to fly to California and punch you in the face. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't... (laughs) I did think it, but I didn't say it, all right? I have to say, I have a new respect for Brian Lunduk today. Yeah, Um, you do. Usually, usually my respect for him is... is, uh, Limited. limited. Let's just call it limited. Limited (laughs) at best. Feel the love already. But earlier on, when Brian was... um, was reviewing the Dell XPS. Uh, he was reading his his script from a Google document that we all have access to. And because I'm a horrible friend, I decided to insert insults into the script while he was reading them, reading it. And he didn't flinch a little bit. And I was quite, I was expect, expecting you to kind of crack up a little bit, Brian, but you did not Kudos. We are, if nothing else, a bastion of uh, professionalism here at Bad Voltage. Was he? <laughs> yeah, right. That's what, that's what it is. Was it all Jono? Was that just Jono doing that? Yes, it, yes, yeah. it was just, just Jono. I, yeah. Can I say this? I am terribly disappointed in Jeremy and Stewart. <laughs> they had a golden opportunity to write words like penis and duck fart all over that document. <laughs> they, if the words had been penis or duck fart, I would have read them out loud into the review. You missed a golden opportunity there, and that is gone forever. I didn't know you had such a fascination with duck accepted. fart. <laughs> Actually, I just thought of the word duck fart, and I'm wondering, I'm assuming ducks fart, right? Is that that's a thing? I'm, I'm assuming. If, you know, hold like on, you guys talk for a minute. You know, sh- talk for a minute while I Google uh, duck fart. Oh, actually, I'm gonna duck duck go duck fart. <laughs> I was gonna say open incognito window. Just died a oh hell no! I want this recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, you came here for the tech news and discussion, and you get this. Yeah, congratulations <laughs> exactly. to you. Good life choices. A- apparently, a duck fart is is a cocktail. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is an actual thing, guys. A duck fart is a cocktail. You pour Kahlua into a three ounce shot glass using a convex side of a bar spoon. Slowly pour Bailey's over the Kahlua, making sure not to disturb it to create a layered effect. Using the same technique, layer Crown Royal over the Bailey's and you have a duck fart. Now that person has either never witnessed a duck fart or has a witness or has witnessed a duck fart and duck farts are particularly unpleasant. <laughs> Here's the thing. I have no way of knowing which it is because I have never seen a duck fart at this to my knowledge. <laughs> I feel like we should change the subject. I, I agree I think entirely. We probably yes, should. Yes, not even sure, sure. Can I tell you, where can to I, segue from there. Can I share a book review? Well, a, a, a book I recommend people read. Oh, it's absolutely. Excellent. There's a book, there's a guy called Dan Lyons who used to do the fake Steve Jobs blog. Um, and he writes for the TV show Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, he went to work at HubSpot, which are a marketing automation company. And he's in his early 50s. And basically, he... Uh, he found the whole culture there and the general culture of Silicon Valley ridiculous. And he wrote a book and he's a comedy writer. So it's quite amusing. And I recommend you go and check it out. It was a great read. Um, we actually had him, I can't remember if you were there Ak, at the all hands uh, at canonical when he came to speak and he was hilarious. He, uh, it was the one in Barcelona. You, yeah, I, I do remember. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Still got the so, uh, somewhere. Anyway, what's the book the called, oh, Jono? God. That's what I was just wondering. It's, co- it's called Disruptive, My Time in a Startup Bubble or something like that. I read the whole thing on the way back from China. It was excellent. Oh, wow. And he's a brilliant writer. And he actually gets into, he, he not only talks about his experience at HubSpot, which frankly, you know, he, some of it's obviously ridiculous. And some of it is, I think he's just kind of whinging a little bit. But um, he talks about just how kind of, dangerous the current culture uh, of money is in silicon valley and it's all about growth and it's not about profit and all this kind of stuff so it, it actually gets into a fairly serious chunk of that in the middle of the book which is really good so but overall it's just quite funny and any any of you who haven't worked in silicon valley um will see how ridiculous it can be and yeah. any, of, any of you who have worked in silicon valley a lot of it will seem very familiar do, to do any of you guys it's watch the show culture silicon valley oh yeah oh I've religiously few, so, so. Yeah. so it's have you seen it I, I have been repeatedly told there are, there are two things that people keep telling me I have to watch. One of them is Silicon Valley, and the other one is Person of Interest, and I haven't had a chance to watch either. And I would like to watch. Oh, Mister yeah, Robot, Person of Interest, but ain't so that great. if you want Silicon maybe Valley, a though. slightly contradictory view of VCs compared to what Jano offered you earlier, watch Silicon Valley. <laughs> Hilarious show. Watch Silicon Valley. From from my experience, VCs in Silicon Valley, that's how they work. <laughs> that has been my experience <laughs> almost to a T. Uh, on the book review front, so I started reading Bad Voltage by Jonathan Little. Are you still reading it? Oh, so annoying. I started really? reading it. Uh, uh, a fan of the show gave it to me when I was up at Linux Fest Northwest. The cover's amazing. Uh, they brought, brought a doggy-eared copy to me. And yeah, the cover is amazing. Sur- if you search for Bad Voltage novel, you'll see it. It is just, the book is possibly the worst science fiction novel I have ever read. Like (laughs) it is so epically bad. And it's not even just me like pumping up how bad it is. It truly is record breakingly awful. It's basically the show in book form. I think it is so bad, you guys. So I'm not going to give anything away right now, but I would like to do a full length review uh, on an upcoming episode once I manage to sit down and digest this regurgitated vomit of a novel in its entirety. <laughs> uh, it's truly, truly heinous. And if anyone would like to cathartically review it along with me, uh, you can pick up copies for about a penny uh, on the internet because it's truly <laughs> terrible. That's, it's that, so funny. That's when, how you know when it's we good. started doing this. Sh- when, when we started doing the show, I remember we had a conversation right at the beginning, which was, you know, we've called the show Bad Voltage and, you know, but there's this book and, uh, you know, I hope that we don't get drowned out in the Google juice. <laughs> Obviously, it took like a week and then we were the top, top, top ranking on Google. So I'm guessing oh. that's why it's not very good. Poor Jonathan Little. <laughs> we, we really screwed things up for him. Well, Although we'll you know, probably triple his sales we'll now. So. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. People are going, oh my so God, they've got a book out? Uh, <laughs> and it's terrible surprise we should now try to crowdsource uh, funding for a book written by the four of us co-written by the four of us that's a worse science fiction book than that bad voltage 
That oh, we're, good. We're now, that's a, so hard to do. That's a genuinely good idea. I, I actually like that idea. It, it, but people listening to I, this show, in. if you're interested in doing that, either tweet us at Bad Voltage or mention something on the forums, because I'd be up for that. That sounds like a wicked idea. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'd yeah. be up for Challenge that. You know accepted. what? I'll even commit to writing my part using the same style and language as Jonathan Littell used in his version of Bad Voltage simply because it's so terribly awful. I would maybe do we that could, for you. To make sure that it's really terrible, maybe we can pick like four characters for the entire book and then we'll each write our, fo- each write our section, but we don't tell each other what's in the section. <laughs> so it's just completely... Random. So, so it's not from, only a terrible science well, fiction novel, but it's also a massive game of consequences. Mm. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And then we'll have to find someone who writes, who does all that cheesy, like, sci-fi illustration and stuff I, like I don't that. get it. You know, How did the hunky scientist suddenly end up on the moon? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly this section's talking about this guy called Brian Lunduk every three words. <laughs> yeah, that's weird how that can happen. <laughs> ah! So, anything else? Have you guys seen anything else that's interesting? Uh, uh, Stuart, I, you, I recently, you got, you got I recently saw a movie that no one should see. So, uh, you ever see High Rise? What was the movie? What was that? High Rise? No, no, no. Yeah, don't. It's, what's, no. What's I'm, I'm trying to it? think of a good book to read now, but I haven't read a book recently that I would really recommend. Oh, an old one. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna kick it a little old school, Jono style review. Uh, the Disappearing Spoon is a very good book that everyone should read. Who was it written by? <laughs> is that like a kids book? Or what something? is that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, with the spoon. It's Did kind it go of a over the moon? modern <laughs> stuff in science together. It's a science it's- book. It's, not, it's The Disappearing Spoon. It's not one of these books where, you know, there's only four pages and they're really thick card. And it's chewable. <laughs> <laughs> did you watch it? Did you read that after you read The Gruffalo? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I the very it's a guy you may have heard of called the Dr. Seuss, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real think piece. <laughs> I love think pieces. Actually, a medical doctor. Hey, there's another book called... Uh, there's a book called The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday, which I'd recommend as well. Excellent book about seeing opportunities in every Oh, obstacle. you do read an awful lot of yes. management bollocks, John. Oh, Bacon. my God. You know, really? It's actually not a management Seriously? It's- Seriously, dude. Does it have the word community in it 5,000 times? Oh, my God, dude. You it got doesn't. to it read doesn't. different books, man. No more I self-help d- books different. for Bacon. <laughs> I don't read. They're not really. I wouldn't categorize them as self-help Are, books, but you, I'm a big have, fan of the Do you have four different editions of what color is your parachute on your bookshelf right now? <laughs> like, I've never on, even man. heard of that. I'll tell you what, right? Here's the deal. Um, you're allowed to read whichever books you want, but if you're reading through a book and you find the word motivation anywhere in that book, you have to burn it in a YouTube video. And that means you will read no books from now on. Pack it in. Read, I don't know, The Lord of the Rings I don't read those kinds of like, you, do. you know, those... Although I have to say, I'm reading a book right now, which is... Oh my god, it's terrible. It's about like, you know, getting consulting business... How you build like consultancies up. And this guy has come up with, you know, the six-point sales system, TM, and all this kind of stuff. Really? I mean, I, I just went, yeah. I would like some business, and business sort of arrived. I admit that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not feeling fully in control of the process, right? It worries You should me. write a book. But I'm... I'm with Stuart on this one. If you if you if you use star maths and wishy thinking, good stuff will happen. Um, so I, I would like to like to end on a, on a total side note. So I hate I hate books that tell you how to do things and hate managey type books like um, you know like, like the conjoined triangles to- of success. Yes, the conjoined triangles of success type crap. It drives me friggin' up the wall. So many years ago, when I was still a dev manager, I started writing a, a book where I basically take every development methodology and rip the shit out of it. And each chapter was its own development methodology. And I, ca- I called the book, um, God, what was the working title I gave it? Your favorite development methodology is stupid or something along those lines. I came up with a couple different variations, but I'm still trying to finish that book. And each one, like I go, through here's the one on 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 agile and i kind of go down the line and i eventually realized and i wrote it snarkily to start with as a cathartic way to deal with the fact that i hated my management 
I realized they are all really stupid, and every book about them is friggin' stupid. All of them, without a single fail. So, anyway, that's just a complete random side note. I don't know if I'd agree. I think some of these books are actually quite good. But I think a lot of those, like, self-help books... I've read a couple of self-help books, and they're crap. But, I, like... The Seven I've, Habits of Highly Effective People, for example, is, that is an excellent. I've oh, oh, honestly, God, I, I hate that book. Though I have heard it's an excellent right book. on it, I have take heard Management Secrets of Garfield, and you buy it and spend twenty dollars on it to boot. I, he, he is predictably I rational. I read somewhere ah. a quote from a uh, one Jeremy Garcia that he highly recommends The Art of Community. So I know Jeremy likes at least some of these kinds of books. <laughs> really, oh, that was harsh. That was below oh. the belt. I uh, no, I Boom. have to say, yeah. but if you look at the art of community and pick something that I really liked about it, I would say that I really liked the proofreading. <laughs> <laughs> because I did, as opposed to D- as opposed to DHTML Utopia, which was not proofread. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling oh, this is devolving music, quickly. Right? That, was, <laughs> that, that was a solid burn, man. That was a solid burn. We should wrap it up before this turns into <laughs> a <laughs> argument about activism. <laughs> 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 And this brings us to the end of this episode of Bad Voltage. Tune in in two weeks for Bad Voltage episode 70, which I can't think of a number or a thing that... Is there anything that goes with the number 70? Is it Old Like people? 69 is a thing. Like 69 has a lot of references, but what's 70? What's 70? Is there, is there something ten. special no. about 70? Mentioned in the Bible. The measure of a man's years. That's a really good point. And on I that totally bombshell, about the Bible. you're supposed to know about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you're Bible reader in chief on this team. <laughs> and now, up. the end of Bad Voltage. Bad Voltage.